What is the crack everyone? It's Nathan here aka The Rambling Kern and Head Instructor of Kern School of Combat. So uh, I was asked last week uh, to do a video about the sparse axe um, and you know as you guys know I am more than happy to do video requests so if you have any please do let me know. So the sparse axe itself is quite a fascinating um, weapon mainly due to how it came about. Um, now this video is going to very much be an introduction because there is a long storied and rather complex history to this um, and it branches out into so many different areas. So this is one that I do plan on revisiting um, but this is more of a bit of a primer and a bit of an introduction to it as was requested so here we go. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Gallo Glass were a um, mercenary force brought in from the uh, western uh, sea, seaboard of um, England and primarily the lowlands, the Isle of Man and in and around the Northumbria region um, although some were up into the uh, northern reaches of Scotland. Um, now the Galaglass themselves were essentially some were uh, more um, Scottish based some were more English um, and as I say you also had the Isle of Man which became very much a Galaglass stronghold now there's this kind of modern uh, conception that the Galagas were primarily the heavily armed troops in Ireland at the time. Now this is very much true to a degree, how they were described and how they uh, are referred to. But over time they become Irish, there is Galagas essentially settlements, there are families, lineages. So after a while what is Irish and what is Galagas is more just a name and a reference to more than anything else. Irish soldiers at the time would have worn very similar equipment. They would have exchanged military equipment, military uh, training, all of these things. So to say that Galagas looks specifically this way and they were this group who did this um, is a useful tool for us looking back, but not necessarily the whole picture. Um, so just to kind of preface with that. Um, so the Sparthax itself is quite a fascinating thing. Um, and like I said, one of the things that is interesting about Ireland is that prior to the Viking invasion, you do not really see the axe on the battlefield. Now, I'm going to bring up a few things for those of you who are um, unfamiliar with um, axes and their construction and how they're used in warfare. Um, you probably wouldn't know how an axe is made and how it's designed. And how an axe is made for warfare is very, very different to how it is made for day-to-day um, -day work, for for use as a tool. Um, now we do have a number of um, axe heads being produced. Uh, however, uh, currently in an awkward situation with the manufacturer, so hopefully he gets that together and makes them, but um, I'm currently not holding on onto my rest for that one. So fingers crossed, but we'll see. Um, but I'm gonna show a few reference pictures from um, axes that were found in the Armagh Tyrone area of Ireland, mainly because these were Galaglass strongholds and as a result we have a wide range of axes that were found here. But to get back to my point of um, wood axes and axes used for tools versus axes used for warfare, there's a very clear distinction that we see in Ireland. So the ones used for tools as you'll see here, have very, very thick cross sections. So if you see from above, they're almost a solid triangle, kind of wedge shape. Now, anyone who's used a wood axe will kind of see that when they go to chop a bit of wood, it's quite wedge shaped in order to split the wood apart. To an exaggerated uh, form of this, you'd see something like a splitting maul, which is essentially like a sledgehammer with a wedge style tip like that on the front of it. Now, if we look again at some of these examples, you can clearly see that some of these are intended purely for um, use as a tool. Now that's not to say you can't kill someone with them but they're not very effective, they wouldn't move particularly well and they'd be very cumbersome to try to swing around as a weapon. And this is where battlefield axes become a very distinct uh, and different thing. Now in a pinch yes I'm sure you could use them to chop into things however I wouldn't recommend it and you'd probably end up breaking them especially if you're trying to chop down a tree. Because as you will see from the cross-section of these axes again looking top down onto it, you'll see that the actual center of the axe is very, very thin. 
The reason being the head or the edge itself, I should say, is a little bit wider than the actual body of it. Basically meaning that when you cut into something, that there's no resist resistance behind it. So the edge travels through until it essentially kind of hit the shaft. Now this varies on the design, but that's kind of the, the overarching principle. So prior to the Viking invasions and incursions into Ireland, you didn't really see the axe on the battlefield. However, after the kind of ninth, well, yeah, the ninth, 10th century onwards, you start to see them uh, more and more across the Irish battlefields and not just being used by the Vikings, but being used by the Irish. Now, the one great thing about an axe is you don't need particularly high quality materials to make them um, and you don't need a superbly skilled smith. Now, certain type of axes you most certainly do, so don't get me wrong on that one, um, and a very well-made uh, battle axe you definitely do. However, you don't need as high quality material, you essentially just need a good steel edge and the body you can make of a lower quality iron or steel um, or mild steel. So these were mass produced across Ireland throughout the medieval period. And as a result, with their rise of popularity, certain types became more and more popular. And you will see these from these examples here in the uh, Dublin Museum. We have the Viking Stacks, which becomes very popular. So you can kind of see a large upswept tip um, into quite a wide uh, face. Now, this is one of the misconceptions that when people look at these axes, they think, oh, they have such a big head, they must be very heavy and very cumbersome. They are not, they are very uh, light. Um, in fact, much, much lighter than you would think, like you will see from the cross sections. Um, they have a very thin um, body, so the actual weight of them is much lighter and much easier to maneuver. I uh, have inspired with them and done various different martial arts and training with them. Uh, I can attest to that myself, even with heavier, blunted versions. So as time progresses, the Irish start to adopt their own particular types and the Galaglass themselves start to develop their own particular types. Um, and obviously they have certain preferences to them. So the early sparse axes look almost indistinguishable essentially from the sort of axes that you would commonly see in uh, Viking hands at the time. So the kind of modern term that's been attributed to them is uh, a Dane axe. Um, now, obviously the Norwegians and um, Swedish and other groups were using similar style of axes. Like I say, it's just the name that's become popular with them. However, we start to see kind of four distinct groups as the years progress. As you move into the 14, 15, and even into the 1600s, you see very particular styles of axes starting to develop around the country. And there's kind of four main groups. Um, and I'm going to show those um, and kind of show where some of these appear. So you kind of have the most um, popular and kind of interesting type, in my opinion. Um, and this is the one that's kind of been popularized as the quintessential Galagas axe. Now, like I said, this was being used in different groups within Ireland, not just the Galagas, but these are the ones that were uh, popularized. Um, and the axe was also still a high status weapon. You did see axes inlaid with silver, such as this example. Um, beautiful work, beautiful craftsmanship, and clearly a weapon of somewhat status. So to think of an axe as just this brute's weapon or a cheap um, throwaway weapon, it's really not. It was something that was made to be top tier, top quality, and clearly used uh, by someone who had the means to, if they wanted to, use an even more expensive weapon, but this is what they chose. Um, and with the centuries as they go by, you do see obviously an increase in pole arms across Europe and their use. Um, however, in Ireland, we have quite a unique um, set of armor and weaponry being used in the country and kind of the popularity of certain things kind of remains here and kind of stays much longer than on mainland Europe and we have a very unique style of warfare being practiced here. Um, so first you have this initial type, this kind of upswept um, upward curving uh, style. Um, you also do have more of a uh, crescent moon style of shape. Um, you'll see some of these on uh, grave effigies. Um, and then you have the, also the much flatter, straighter edge type. Um, as you'll see, uh, depicted in quite a few different areas. And interestingly, you see this on a few different carvings, as well as in John Derrick's image of Ireland, you see 
an image of a hall bird with a very similar edge, however, clearly distinguished as being something different due to the spike on the back. Um, and then you have the uh, the final type, which I'm going to bring up here. So um, there is numerous different axes found, um, numerous different axes found in the, the rivers across Ireland. Um, even this type that I just want to show for my own sake, because uh, if anyone who knows the Smiths, you can make it. I would love to have this one made eventually. It's just a really unique little piece. Um, and clearly there is a, a very popular um, rise amongst the use in Ireland at the time. Um, now, while it is kind of referred to as the Galagas's weapon, there was other groups in Ireland using them. Um, their production really starts to ramp up as the years go by, and obviously with armour being more um, commonly seen in Ireland, there is obviously going to be a popularity of pole arms being used. So, like I said, this is kind of an introduction to the Spartax. Um, and it is kind of a strange catch-all term because as you can see from the axis that I've shown you, there's a lot of very different types of these. Um, it's not just simply the, the one standard shape. Um, earlier styles look very similar to axes found elsewhere in Europe. However, as the years go by, the shape very much starts to change and become a very unique and distinctive weapon, um, almost becoming a weapon ubiquitous with the Irish. And that's, uh, I think, quite fascinating. And I think that's why I kind of, it's important to think of these almost as a, a symbol of Ireland and a weapon of Ireland. Um, and obviously by the, the late 1600s, you know, the ownership of weapons amongst the Irish was kind of outlawed and all different things started to happen. But I think these are a very important weapon to understand. And I think also quite a culturally important weapon for Ireland um, and a very symbolic weapon. Um, and it is something that you really don't see represented a lot and you don't see included in a lot of things. And like I said, this is very much a cursory view of the Spartax. I do want to touch much further into this and I would really like to do some weapon testing. Um, and of course, if anyone has any Smiths to recommend, please do let me know. Like I said, I've had two in production for a while now and not really too sure if uh, I'm going to see them. <laughs> However, uh, it is something that I do want to dive into further. And of course, this is a topic that I do plan on doing uh, more videos on in the future. It's just, uh, like I said, I want to kind of have some hand-on examples to show you. However, thankfully we do have a lot of these nice finds. And um, so I've been able to actually show you lots of nice images in this video. Now, if you guys have any further videos that you would like to see or any kind of suggestions, please do let me know. Um, I also have a Patreon if you'd like to support my work and fund the uh, purchase and production of any of these uh, axes and weapons that you will see. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and of course, I run classes in Irish martial arts here in Dublin. So if you are interested in those, um, you will find uh, links below. Um, and I'd really do appreciate you watching. Um, please do like, comment, subscribe, all the good stuff. It does help. Um, like I said, a bit of an introduction to the Spartax. I do plan on doing future videos on it, but I really do hope you enjoyed that. Once again, thank you very much for watching and salam.